I do have to talk about one of the most remarkable stories that I have seen in a long time. You know, in this business, it becomes a daily grind. And the news keeps coming. It doesn't stop. There's always way more on the cutting room floor than there is that you actually get to talk about on the show. And the truth is, most of it's bad news. It just is. And it can grind on you. This is not one of those stories. This is one of those stories that it is a pleasure to bring to people. And part of the reason for that is because it's just a story that tells itself. It does a better job of explaining what I'd like to convey than I ever could. And what I'm talking about is a case that starts with an incredibly dark and gruesome beginning, and should. that That's the way that we should feel about this. It's, of course, what happened with Botham Jean. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with this story, this is the, the quick version. Botham John, just a regular dude, I think he was 26 years old, so not much younger than me. Just sitting at home one night, eating ice cream, watching TV. And all of a sudden, in walks a police officer with no warning, doesn't knock, doesn't yell police, just walks into his apartment while he's sitting there in his PJs, going to town on a bowl of ice cream, watching TV, and starts freaking out. Now, he has no idea why she's in his apartment. And then, because she's freaked out too, she pulls her weapon, shoots him, and doesn't kill him instantly, but eventually he dies. And then you have to think about it from the other perspective, too. This Dallas police officer, a woman by the name of Amber Geiger, she's just come home, or to what she thinks is home. She's actually on the wrong floor and has walked into the wrong apartment, but she doesn't know that. She looks and sees some random guy sitting on her couch, or what she thinks is her couch, watching TV, eating ice cream, and can't figure out why, starts to freak out, pulls her weapon, and shoots, and shoots to kill, which is what police officers are trained to do. When you see somebody and you believe that they are about to, to be aggressive, you shoot to kill because once you've drawn your weapon, and this is true of civilian gunmen if they know what they're doing, they're not trying to take out somebody's kneecap because you, you just don't do that. Once you've taken out a deadly weapon, you realize it has one function and it is designed to kill somebody, and that's what you're trying to do. I mean, until they invent guns like they have in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. where you can shoot somebody and it just knocks them out, which, I mean, the just science just isn't there yet. Until they invent those, that's how people are going to use firearms to defend themselves. So... From both perspectives, this is a horrible story. No matter how you slice it. But here's the thing. It would be bad enough if this just happened to a regular person. Geiger is not a regular person. She is a police officer who has taken an oath to serve and protect they are expected to be better than us. They are held to a higher standard when it comes to defending themselves, dealing with matters of the law, keeping the peace of society. They're held to a higher standard and should be. As much as I love and revere our police officers, I mean, you guys know if you've been listening to me for any amount of time, not only my commentary, but also doing charity events to help police officers, that kind of thing. I love our police officers. And it's because I love our police officers that we should hold this standard. There is a reason that they hold that extra level of esteem, and that extra level of esteem also ought to come 
with a higher level of expectation and responsibility. There's no two ways about it. The case that wrapped up this week with, with Geiger and resulted in a murder conviction and 10 years in prison is 100% appropriate. Because given her training especially, this is something that would be irrational behavior for a normal person. Because even if I, as a concealed carry permit holder, walked into an apartment that I thought was mine but saw that it was not, if I walked in and saw a burglar, of course I would shoot and shoot to kill. That's the reason I have my sidearm. But it would be very odd behavior for a burglar to be in pajamas eating ice cream, watching TV, even if I did believe mistakenly that it was my apartment, I would at least assume that the guy is, I don't know, a hobo, and pull my gun on him and hold him there till authorities arrived. But I don't immediately take my firearm out and start shooting. So this is something that would be incorrect behavior, both philosophically and legally. This would be behavior that the rational man, which is a legal standard that is used all the time in courts, that the normal rational person would not engage in. And so the fact that a normal rational person would not engage in it is even made worse by the fact that this is not a normal person, this is a police officer. And the fact that she couldn't have at least held her gun out threatening him but not firing is also incredibly disturbing. As far as I can tell, and I know that this is just my opinion, but it is an opinion that I apparently is backed up now by a murder conviction, she should be convicted for murder. That's not something that a normal person should do, much less a police officer. And yes, I understand that this thing was done without malice. I understand that it was done out of confusion. I don't know if the the blood toxicity test came back negative, so it says there was nothing in her system. I, I believe that, and I think that that's correct, but I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant. I, I think maybe she may have been on some kind of hallucinogen or something that wouldn't show up, because it just seems so odd to me that that would take place. It's so outside the norm, even for a regular person. But nonetheless, that's neither here nor there. The point is that either way, a murder conviction is correct in this circumstance, as far as I can tell. And so, this is where we are. Ten years still seems a little bit light to me, but given that there was no malicious intent, so far as we know, and it was definitely not premeditated, and there is as of yet no reason for us to believe that it is premeditated, Murder with 10 years, probably pretty close to right. If it had been murder and 20 years, again, no premeditation, no, um, no malice included in this case, 20 years would, I think, not be inappropriate if that had been what the jury decided. But the point is, the left has tried to make this into a race issue. And there's no reason to believe that that is the case. Right now, there is absolutely zero evidence that this was in any way race-related. They tracked down text messages saying that, oh, well, she had some deep-seated underlying racism. Even if that were the case, even if there is a little bit of racism, you can't prove that she did this because the guy was black. There was one commentator that I watched, a, lo a local news commentator in Dallas, which I agreed with like 99% of what he said. But he said, but if it were a white guy sitting there, she wouldn't have shot. There's no way to know that. None of us can ever know that. And if it was racially motivated, there's no way to prove that it was or wasn't. And so because of that, you have to operate on the assumption that it was not that. But whether it was or not, it bothers me that we try to turn everything into a tribalist battle. And if you want to know what the solution to that is, I want you to watch this clip. This is a commentary, or sorry, this is a testimony by the victim, Botham, by his brother, 
Bryant. Or, sorry, Brant. So this is Brant on the stage giving his testimony. And it's one of the absolute, it is absolutely one of the most incredible videos I have seen. I have never seen anything like this in all my years of being in journalism, news, news commentary, all the way back to having graduated from, from Auburn. Never seen anything like this. I want to go ahead and show this to you, and I'm going to show you the full video, unedited, no commentary, just watch it for yourself. It speaks volumes. I don't even have to comment on it during the video. Go ahead and watch. I don't want to say twice or for the hundredth time what you've or how much you've taken from us. I think you know that. But I just... I hope you go to God with all what, all the guilt, all the things, the bad things you may have done in the past. Each and every one of us may have done something that we're not supposed to do. If you truly are sorry, I know I can speak for myself. I, I forgive you, and. I know if you go to God and ask him, he will forgive you. And I don't think anyone could say it. Again, I'm speaking for myself, not even bad for my family. But I love you just like anyone else. And I'm not gonna say I hope you rot and die just like my brother did, but I see, I, I personally want the best for you. And I, I wasn't gonna ever say this in front of my family or anyone, but I don't even want you to go to jail. I want the best for you. Because I know that's what that's exactly what both of them would want you to do. And the best would be give your life to Christ. I'm not gonna say anything else. I think giving your life to Christ would be the best thing that both of them would want you to do. Again, I love you as a person. And I don't wish anything bad on you. I don't know if this is possible, but can, can I give her a hug, please? Please? Yes. I don't even have to say anything. I mean, I'm completely at a loss just because how, how do you respond to that? And for those of you that have been watching me for any amount of time, you know, catching me speechless is practically impossible to do.
But the thing is, any commentary that I would give, any pearls of wisdom that I could offer in response to this, would by great lengths fail in comparison to what you just saw play out there. I've got nothing. I will say this, because I found this fascinating, and this actually does add a little bit of context, which makes the clip itself more powerful. He had no idea the cameras were rolling. This wasn't done to gain fame or internet notoriety or because he thought that this was going to blow up. They revealed in interviews since then he didn't even know the cameras were on or that he was being recorded at all. This is one of the most genuinely selfless acts I have ever seen from anyone. To be the victim of something like this, that you've had your own brother robbed from you, and to do that, to come down and embrace his killer. You can't find a better example anywhere. Maybe an equal example, but certainly not a better example of the kind of love of Jesus Christ dwelling in somebody than that. I mean, that is not quite to the level of Christ, of course, because we're just just like us. Brant is a, a flawed human being, too. But I mean... If there's any part of the Bible that that reminds me of, it's Christ asking God to forgive the people while they're murdering him. I mean, sure, maybe it's not quite to that level, but it's about the only Bible narrative that I can think of that, that is similar to that in certain ways. And just watching that, and I found this out later, I didn't know this until after I had seen that video. His family members and and he are all members of the Church of Christ, a similar kind of church as the, the one that I go to. And apparently they're a Harding University family. The, the victim himself, Botham, actually went to Harding, as I understand it. Now, I'm, I'm getting this secondhand information, but that's what I had heard from somebody that I trust and is a reliable source which I didn't know when I watched this, but whether they were or not, before I even knew that, I looked at this and said, that, that is putting the love of Christ on display in a way that I've never seen. And the truth is, I just assumed that they were members of some kind of church somewhere, I had no idea that they were members of the same church that, that I belong to. And so that just dumbfounded me even more. But the fact that somebody can do that, I, I hope that one day, I may not live long enough to see this day, but I hope that one day I have that kind of compassion for other people. Because I'm going to tell you right now, I probably don't. I don't think I could have pulled that off. And I'm looking to this guy as an example to try to build my compassion towards other people, because I'm not there yet. I'll just be honest with you, I'm not. I, I wish I was, I'm not. And I think very few people are. But one thing that astounds me about that, that I think makes it even more impactful, is that he said in there that he was never going to say this in front of his family. Now, I don't know exactly what he meant by that. I, I don't know the man's heart. But based on what we saw in that video, and, and this is just my observation, I think what he meant was there are members of his own family, we don't know if he meant immediate family, extended family, whatever, that he knows would not have wanted him to do that, would not have wanted him to sit on the stand. Remember, this is before sentencing and could affect the sentencing verdict of the jury. 
that they would not have wanted him to say that, I don't even want you to go to jail. I just want you to give your life over to Christ. This is somebody that has removed every semblance of vengeance from his heart. Because other than maybe killing one of your children, I don't know that there's something worse than having someone kill your sibling. And I'm just trying to think of it, if somebody had taken my brother or sister from me, I think that with a lot of time and counseling and scripture reading and prayer, I could probably get to that point. I don't know that I would have been able to do so in the span of time that he's had since his brother's murder. And because of that, this inspires me to be a better person. It inspires me to further my own walk with Christ. Because this is somebody that has taken revenge completely out of his spiritual glossary. I mean, that part of his vocabulary is just gone at this point, so far as I can tell. And he has moved to the point that Christ was at, which is reconciliation. He doesn't want bad for her. He doesn't want anything terrible to happen. In his mind, it's not about getting away with something or making her feel bad to make himself feel better. This is one of the most selfless things I've ever seen any human being ever do. And that is not a small compliment. Because I've met some incredibly, uh, incredible, amazing people. But what amazes me about this is that this kind of compassion is contagious and should be. In fact, and I don't know if this was affected by this or, or what order these events took place in, but the Dallas judge that oversaw this case, Tammy Kemp, she also went forward and, and hugged the murderer and went out to her car and gave her her own personal Bible. And this is the quote that she said when she handed the murderer her Bible. You just need a tiny mustard seed of faith. You start with this. That is where real forgiveness lies. Real healing. And this woman, Geiger is not beyond repentance, is not beyond God's love. She still has the ability to be forgiven of our sins for, from God and from others, as Brant just displayed. And because of that, this young man decided, made a conscious decision to look at her not as her as his brother's murderer, but as a fellow child of God that is as in much need of the forgiveness of Jesus Christ as he is. That is a hard thing to do. To remove, to remove what has been done to you and to think about what that person needs. That's something that Christians that have been Christians for decades have not been able to do with the level of ease that this man did. But unfortunately, unfortunately, there are people, I don't know how, but there are people that look at this and they want vengeance. That they're still about revenge and, and trying to do evil and wish evil upon this person, even though they're not the victim. And so, the Freedom From Religion Foundation, they are actually filing a formal complaint claiming that the judge violated the First Amendment by handing the victim her Bible. Now, I want you to remember, she didn't sentence the woman to read the Bible. 
nor did she say she has to read the Bible to get out on parole or anything like that. She just said, I understand that you need spiritual help, essentially. I'm paraphrasing here. This is how to get that help. That's it. Didn't force her to do it. Didn't force her to take it. Offered it to her. The person took it. And now the Freedom From Religion Foundation is fu is filing a formal complaint against this woman, trying to get her in legal trouble from the First Amendment violation. Well, first of all, like I said, she's not forcing anybody to read it. So this isn't any kind of legally forced proselytizing. But second of all, let me tell you about a man named John Jay. John Jay was there when the Constitution was written. He was not a signer of it. But he's one of the three authors of the Federalist Papers, which are the original argument for the passage of the Constitution. So he was intimately familiar with the structure of the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. He was the first Supreme Court justice appointed by George Washington himself. The very first one. Very first Supreme Court justice, uh, chief justice. You know what John Jay did in his New York courtroom? He find a man. Remember, this is in seven, the 1790s. He find a man $5,000 for blaspheming Jesus. $5,000. That was a lot of money at that time. I mean, I don't know exactly what the inflation rate was, but it was a lot. So the idea that the freedom, the, the First Amendment somehow guarantees somebody that they will not, I don't even know how to phrase this, honestly, but the idea that the founders and the people who put the First Amendment into place would have opposed something like this when you understand that is patently absurd. And frankly, I'm not even 100% sure that I agree with John Jay on that. I think that he might have been overstepping his bounds there. Though I find it hard to argue with somebody with that level of credential on what the Constitution actually means. But nonetheless, the idea that the founders and the people who put this together would have opposed that? Sorry, you won't be able to convince me of that. Or any other objection, uh, objective person. And the Freedom From Religion Foundation is not the only one. Sean King, a white guy that pretends to be a black person to boost his political career, He's kind of the original Beto O'Rourke. He, he is a white dude, and his parents are white, and if you look at pictures of him as a kid, he's clearly white and has almost strawberry blonde hair, but now pretends to be a black person and dresses like a black person so that people will read his tweets and his articles. He's worked for the Young Turks before. So that's who Sean King is. The man's a phony from the beginning and, and always has been. This is his latest tirade and commentary on the whole thing. So... Obviously, there's part of this I can't read, but he says, ask yourself again, would Botham Sean have gotten, uh, had he walked into a white woman's home while she was still in her pajamas eating ice cream and shot and killed her, then texted his friends and refused to provide first aid? Ten years? No. They, he might have got the death penalty. I don't know if that's true or not, but the point is, how anybody can look at that situation and try to turn it into some tribalist, racist war between all of us. It amazes me that people have the ability to do that, and he's not the only one. Some attacking this act of extreme mercy and grace directly. This is a tweet, I don't know if it'll pop up. Uh, this is a tweet from a guy named Bishop Tabert Swan. And his caption of this whole thing is, Post-Traumatic Slavery Syndrome which is absurd on a number of levels, but primarily because anybody that understands the gospel of Christ, and this guy is no bishop, I don't know if that's his name or if that's supposed to be a title, but if this guy is purporting to be a follower of Christ, he is a bald-faced liar and will burn in hell for doing that, if, if this is his takeaway from that event. When he's saying post-traumatic slavery syndrome, you could not be further from the truth. Because true slavery, slavery to sin, is when you follow your own instincts and do whatever it is that you want in the moment. 
This is a guy that's saying there are people of my own family that don't agree with this synopsis. I am going to catch flack from people who I love just for saying this, but it's the right thing to do, so I'm going to do it anyway. He had to deny himself, which the Bible tells us to do. He had to deny his own instincts and what he wanted to do, that visceral revenge tactic, that natural reaction that all humans have. He had to actually forego that to be able to do what he did. And the takeaway from that ought to be, this man was as free as anybody can be. In that moment, he was as free as any human being can be. Because he has thrown all of his animalistic sinful instincts to the side. Everything that would tell him, get her, hate her, destroy her, want what's worst for her, you should desire to tear her apart. You should want the worst sentence possible for her. That's what his instincts, I'm sure, because he's a human being, were telling him to do. He chose to do the exact opposite and go as far as you can in the other direction. If your instinct is to follow your own sinful impulses, you're the one that's a slave, not this guy. This is somebody that's ignoring those instincts to follow the gospel of Christ. That is ignoring his natural inclinations to do what is right. And to follow God and be to conform to his image. This man's far freer than you ever will be, if you continue to think this way. And this is the final one. White people have been using Christianity to gaslight us up until forgiving them for white supremacy since the ships arrived. The grace given to Amber Geiger after killing Botham Jean is no different. Well, first of all, this guy doesn't understand grace. Because grace is unmerited favor. Of course Geiger doesn't deserve this treatment. No human being deserves that level of grace from another person or from God. That's the point of grace. If you deserve it, it's not grace. The forgiveness that is being offered here is not because she earned it, because if she earned it, there would be no need for the grace in the first place. This is somebody that doesn't understand the teachings of Christ, all three of these people. And I watched this, and I watched this narrative play out, and I thought, how can people see that and be so unaffected by it. See that and still want vengeance and vitriol. Think about that. Th these are people that, even though I genuinely believe that they care about Botham John, or at least I want to assume the best in them, and so I'm going to do that, I'm just going to give them the benefit of the doubt and assume that they do actually care about Botham John. Okay. Well, you may have cared about him in the sense that you care about all people, but you didn't know him. You're looking at somebody who had grown up with him, who had known him his entire life. This was his brother. He's the victim. He's the one that has had a part of him, a part of his family, ripped out of his life forever and can't get him back, and he can find it in him. He can find it in himself to forgive this woman, and you can't? And how anyone can watch that and thumb their nose at an act of extreme mercy and grace like that was just completely lost on me. And then I remembered a very specific passage of Scripture in the Bible. And once I read this and, and remembered it and looked through it, it, it makes perfect sense. It follows right along with it. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? 
Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made the foolishness of the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs, and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, to Jews a stumbling block, and to Gentiles foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. You see, you can tell by their tweets. You can tell by their vitriol. You can tell by the way that they look at this and go, that guy's na naive. He's weak. He's not going after her the way that he ought to. That's what these verses are talking about. The world looks at that action, and they don't see compassion. Or they do, but they don't see compassion as a good thing. And so they thumb their nose at it. They look down on it. They don't understand it. Why? That verse explains it. The world is not going to understand the mercy and compassion of Jesus Christ. They can't. Because unless you're there, unless you've been forgiven and you see yourself as a flawed individual that is in desperate need of forgiveness just like everybody else, you can't get to that point. Until you see yourself as the person who is the not the victim, but instead the perpetrator, until you see the hatred in your own heart, until you see the pride in your own heart as something that harms others and has earned you eternal damnation, and the only way to get out of that is through mercy and grace, then you're not going to see yourself in the eyes of the perpetrator. You're not going to be able to relate to that person. All you see is that you got offended, you got harmed, and because of that, you want to do whatever it was they did to you back to them. That's all you can see. That's what it means to live like the world. If you want to know how to live like Christ, do what this guy did. Extend grace to people who don't deserve it, who haven't earned it, who every instinct in your body is saying, don't do it, do what you want to do. Get back at them. And then there's Christ standing there saying, I forgave you. Forgive other people the way that I forgave you. That is how to understand forgiveness. That's how somebody gets to this point, that they can embrace their own brother's murderer. It's the only way that you can. Because while everybody else sees foolishness in mercy and weakness in forgiveness, those of us that understand Christ understand that in defeat, in being the victim, he became the conqueror. The greatest human tragedy that has ever been perpetrated is when the Jewish elders and the Romans murdered the world's most perfect person for crimes that he did not commit. And in that very moment, he was still able to say, Father, forgive them because they don't understand what they're doing. That's the level of grace and mercy that we're supposed to see in Christ. Yeah, the world looks at that as a massive loss. The world looks at that as, this guy died on a cross, why would you follow that person? The world sees it that way, we're not supposed to. We look at that and see strength. And anybody that has not had their heart turned completely to stone looks at that video and sees strength, looks at that video and sees mercy and forgiveness and wants to be like that guy. To anybody that still has a soul within them, that's what they see. But even these people that don't see that, those hearts of stone can be turned back into hearts of flesh with time and by being shown the love of Christ. I've been a minister for 15 years now. Preached who knows how many sermons. Taught literally thousands of Bible classes. 
I, I would not be at all shocked if I've actually th- taught more than a thousand Bible classes at this point. I have a daily talk show where I do devotionals at the end of every single one. I've been speaking to thousands of people at, at one time, both over broadcast and live. I have a really big platform compared to most Christians. I guarantee you that in 15 years of being a Christian, I have not done enough. I've not done as much as this guy did in 3 minutes and 30 seconds to com- to convince people of the love of Christ. There are going to be people all around the world that look at that and say, okay, there may be something to this Christian thing. If that's the kind of love and peace that you can find by being a Christian, then maybe I ought to look into it. I'm not saying that the work that the rest of us are doing aren't, isn't good. I think that I've, I've done, I hope that I've done a decent amount of good in my lifetime. But I don't think any of it measured up to that. Because, yeah, I can give you all the the context of, you know, whatever book of the Bible that you want. I, I can give you some extra historical information. I can academically convey to you a lot more about the Bible than the vast majority of the population. Guarantee you, I can't come anywhere close to convincing people the way that that guy just did in three minutes. He's done more for the kingdom in that amount of time than I probably will my entire life. Good. I hope that that stays true. And if he's watching this, and I doubt that he is, Botham, you're one of my role models now. And I hope that I get to the the spiritual level that you're at right now. God bless you, man. Just in case you were wondering, yes, I am a straight white Christian male and a small government constitutionalist, which means I have no chance of getting any help from the government and wouldn't accept their help even if they offered. Which means I'm going to need you to like and subscribe because my gun collection is not going to pay for itself.